Next, Monitor invites you to Meet the Press, America's press conference of the year and winner of every major award in its field. Our guest today is John J. McCloy, advisor to the President for Disarmament. We'll bring you today's program in a moment after this message. This is Morgan Beatty. If you take a long trip this summer, you'll probably travel far beyond the range of your local NBC station. But at the same time, you'll be driving into areas covered by some of the other 192 NBC affiliates in the continental United States. You'll easily identify an NBC station by many of the same voices you're used to hearing on NBC at home. The familiar voices who report news on the hour, emphasis, and weekend monitor. These programs are a constant part of the NBC family, whether you're listening in California, Kansas, or Connecticut. Each station is backed by the alert service and staff of NBC News, a staff that already extends around the world and continues to expand with new bureaus recently opened in Africa, South America, and Canada. Travel anywhere in the USA, but always stay well informed by staying tuned to the world on NBC Radio. Every year, more than 6,000 people drown in boating accidents, swimming, falling in, or just horsing around. And did you know that about 86% of those who drown are male, while two-thirds are more than 14 years old? If you go near the water, you'll be safer if you know how to swim. Not all of us had the opportunity to learn when we were young, and we probably think swimming lessons are just for kids. Not so. The National Safety Council urges everyone to learn to swim for pleasure and protection. Today's guest on Meet the Press is John J. McCloy, advisor to the President for Disarmament. Mr. McCloy is responsible for the overall United States disarmament policy. He has been guiding the general nuclear test ban negotiations and recently returned from Moscow, where he was participating in bilateral talks with the Soviet Union on disarmament. Our panel today consists of Ed Newman, NBC News, John W. Finney, New York Times, Max Lerner, New York Post Syndicate, and William Fry, Christian Science Monitor. Lawrence E. Spivak will moderate. John J. McCloy, who was our guest today, was appointed Chief Advisor on Disarmament by President Kennedy in January of this year. A lawyer, a banker, and a skilled negotiator, he has served the government for many years in important posts. He was High Commissioner in Germany during the critical years of 1949 to 1952, and before that, the Assistant Secretary of War and President of the World Bank. He returned recently from the Soviet Union, where he had extensive talks with Premier Khrushchev, talks which have been the subject of nationwide comment and speculation. The bill Mr. McCloy recommended for the establishment of the United States Disarmament Agency is scheduled for Senate hearings tomorrow. And now, Mr. McCloy, we'll begin the questions with Mr. Newman. Mr. McCloy, what would you calculate the chances are of a disarmament agreement with Russia of even the most limited kind? It's hard to appraise the exact uh, percentages of a thing like that. I think that there are good chances of getting an agreement within the broad limits that you asked the question, either in terms of initial measures or perhaps uh, more drastic measures. Well, I, I can't help wondering why you say that, since you appear to be having some difficulty even in accomplishing the agreement with the Russians to hold a conference on what is, therefore, your hopefulness based. Well, I think it is upon the general realization on the part of the statesmen on both sides of the horrendous character of the weapons of modern uh, mass destruction and the realization that something has to be done with this problem. The fact that some underbrush has been cleared away, I'm not over sanguine about it, but I do believe this imperative uh, upon statesmen is going to produce some results at some point. Did you hear anything from Mr. Khrushchev when you saw him that led you to think that there was some hope? Some hope? There were some things that he said that I thought opened up the possibility of, uh, of hope. Uh, he, on some of his points of view, uh, he seemed to me somewhat obdurate, and others he seemed to me to be uh, somewhat uh, receptive. Can you indicate what any of those points are, especially well, those seemed that to be more. You? He, he seemed to be more receptive, I think, in this whole field of uh, inspection and control than I think the uh, Soviets had heretofore been. They've been a lot of, rather pathological, I think, about this uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. some lining espionage with control. I thought I sensed a little less sensitivity in this respect. Mr. Finney. Mr. McCoy, did this uh, modification on controls also apply to the uh, immediate issue of the test ban treaty? I'm afraid on the test ban treaty, he's taken a rather crystallized position. This is a great disappointment to us, of course, because there I thought that this would be the first breakthrough, but I sensed nothing that in what he said or what the Mr. Zorin said that would indicate a change in the Soviet position that's already been rather well uh, crystallized in Geneva and the test ban. Well, Mr. McCloy, this week the president announced we are going back to make uh, <coughs> one last try to reach a treaty on a test ban. If we are not able to reach one, and as you indicated, it looks very doubtful, would you personally recommend a resumption of atomic tests? Well, if there may be two phases to your question. You ask whether there's uh, any prospect of, of our success in going back. Mr. Dean is going back. I think in view of the Soviet note, I think the chances would be rather slim. What I recommend to the president as the president's advisor, I think, is perhaps best kept between me and the president. Well, I was trying to put this in a personal way, uh -huh. sir. Your personal views yeah. at this point, would you it's personally a little, recommend... a little hard to divorce your personal view from your official view when you have this position. Uh, certainly, uh, the, uh, I would respond uh, to the president giving the best advice I could. I think I'd hesitate to say at this stage what it would be. Let me just point one thing out, though. Is the crux of the matter, as I see it, is this question as to whether or not the Soviets are testing. We don't know whether they're testing or not. There's no evidence that I've seen that's convincing one way or the other. If they are testing and we're not testing, that does pose a real problem because at some point there will be an uh, impairment of the security of the country. Have we not already reached that point, Mr. McCoy? I think that's probably something for... Uh, scientists and uh, others better equipped than I to answer. My general impression from what I've heard is that I think we probably have not reached it at this particular point. This is uh, more guesswork on my part, perhaps, than, than uh, the opinion on which the security of the country should be based. Mr. Cl McCloy, did I understand you to say that you didn't think there was much chance of getting anywhere in Geneva, for Mr. Medine, Dean to get anywhere in Geneva on the test? I said that, particularly since just uh, within 48 or 72 hours, we've gotten a, uh, a note from the Soviet uh, Union which so firmly restates its position that I would think it would be rather doubtful. But I'm hopeful, and I'm sure the president is hopeful, that when he does go back, that uh, he might be able to persuade the, the uh, Soviet representative there to review their position and perhaps moderate it. Well, the president has indicated that we will probably go back to testing and Mr. Dean gets nowhere. So what effect will that have on your disarmament conference if the president decides to resume nuclear testing? Well, of course, the nuclear testing is separated from the general disarmament conference, uh, conferences. Uh, due to the request of the Soviet Union itself, we divorced the nuclear testing from the comprehensive negotiations. I would use every device that I could, considering the uh, great, as I say, the great urgency, the great imperative to do something about m moderating the possibilities of a nuclear ca catastrophe, which the finite mind really can't grasp. And if we can do it with testing or without testing, uh, I would uh, I'd do everything we could to move ahead in this field. I don't believe that they're mutually exclusive. I must say they're not particularly helpful if they're in that in one. If we're not reaching any agreement in one, uh, it's not very helpful that we'll be able to reach an agreement in the other. But I think we should continue continue to try, Mr. Fry. To what extent, Mr. McCoy, do you think that Khrushchev stonewalling on a test ban is attributable to communist China's desire to test the bomb? Well, we, this has been suggested on a number of occasions that perhaps the, he had some sort of an agreement uh, in regard to China in talking to Mr. Khrushchev about it and to, Mr., and to other Soviet officials. They have said that the crystallization of their position in Geneva on the test ban was due entirely to their experience in the Congo, and they haven't suggested that China was involved. In your talks with Mr. Zorin and with Mr. Khrushchev about the participants in a general disarmament negotiation, has there been any talk of the possibility of Red China joining those negotiations? 
No, we didn't talk about the uh, inclusion of Red China. The suggestions that have been made so far did not include Red China. At some point, if we're going to have uh, any drastic uh, and general disarmament, I would think that China would have to be brought into it in some manner. One thing that concerns a great many people, I think, who are interested in the whole, this disarmament thing is that the United States feels obliged to go along and with uh, Khrushchev in this uh, utopian plan for general and complete disarmament, total disarmament in our day. Uh, what do you think is the justification for this rather, well, uh, is it not a hypocritical po point of view? I don't think it's hypocritical, even though it may be a remote, remote objective. I have the feeling, the very strong feeling, that we cannot have general or complete disarmament unless, until we have a better means of settling our international disputes. But I believe those two things can go hand in hand. That's the obverse and the reverse of the medal. And I believe that the urgency is so great that we really have to explore every avenue, every honorable, every reasonable, proper avenue, to try to reach as drastic a means of moderating this, uh, the potentialities of uh, a nuclear catastrophe, catastrophe that we can. But what about the key problem of what's known technically as the clandestine weapon problem, the impossibility of being sure that you could find all the nuclear weapons? Uh, could we ever agree to, to scrap every weapon that we possess knowing that it was technologically impossible to determine that the Soviet Union had done the same thing? I do feel that we never can get a perhaps a hundred percent control system, one on which we can completely rely. But if we can reduce the, um, the weapons down to a point where there is only a remote possibility of being able to uh, hide one or two, then I think an international police force or some other peacekeeping machinery might be erected which would justify our confidence uh, in uh, reducing our arms to a very drastic degree. I think this is a remote uh, possibility, but I do believe that some way statesmen have to move in this direction in order to remove from mankind this uh, threat of its own destruction. Mr. Liner. Mr. McCloy, I'm going to ask a question that I find many quite simple people asking all the time. Namely, both sides are talking disarmament, yet both sides are arming very fast and very hard. What sense does that make to us? Well, this is a, this is a contradiction. It's a paradox. On the other hand, it seems to me the fact that they are arming very hard and they are we are in this arms race is just the time when the urgency is greatest to deal with this problem. And I feel that it's something like where fires are around, you have to look to your fire equipment. And the very urgency of the existence of tensions and the uh, heightening of the arms race is just the time when we should uh, devote our best talents and our best thought to the means of avoiding war and moderating the arms race, the burdens of it and the dangers that are implicit in it toward uh, creating a uh, nuclear Yes, I, I understand that, and I sympathize with it. But when you get a combination of bigger and bigger missiles and rockets and more fear that goes along with that, you get into a kind of spiral, don't you? Uh, almost a missile fear spiral. How do you think that spiral can be broken? It can be broken in a lot of ways. I think uh, the, perhaps the most important thing is to turn it down. Uh, to start with initial measures. That's why I was so disappointed over the uh, Geneva outcome, because I thought that might be symbolic of a desire to moderate this arms race if we could get uh, uh, some s number of missiles destroyed. Uh, anything to, to change the pace and to turn it downward, I think, would be highly desirable, and I believe practicable. There was one moment last December when about 25 American scientists and experts made an unofficial trip to Moscow and met with an equal number of Russian scientists and experts. And those that came back, uh, who reported to the nation here, said that they felt there had been something like almost a meeting of mind between them and the Russians. Now, since then, we've slipped a good deal away from a meeting of mind, <clears throat> or haven't we? Well, I don't know that there's been any slipping away amongst those scientists or those people that uh, had that communion of uh, thought. Since then, uh, uh, tensions have arisen, 
But there are always tensions, or will have to be tensions. We have Korea, we have Laos, we have Cuba, we have the Congo. And if we didn't deal with this uh, question merely because there were tensions, we might never get at it. And I think it's important, even in the midst of those tensions, to do it. Now, this same group are going to meet again, I think, this fall up in Vermont. And I think that's all to the good, so that they can exchange ideas and so that they can get the idea that we're not trying to uh, uh, conduct an espionage campaign every time we talk about a control. Mr. Newman. On Friday, uh, Prime Minister Khrushchev said that when you saw him a few weeks ago, he told you that Russian scientists had said to him that they could manufacture a super bomb equivalent to 100 million tons of TNT. When he told you that, what did you say to him? Well, I indicated, I don't know that I can recall exactly what I said. I think I can talk about this because he's talked about it himself. Uh, he mentioned this uh, large bomb, which would translate in other terms would be a 100 megaton bomb. I said I didn't think that it uh, helped very much to get talking about these horrendous weapons, that we had some, perhaps not that large, but uh, we could make a 100 megaton bomb. There was no problem in that. Uh, he indicated that he could lift one with a rocket. We have other means to lift them. Uh, I just indicated, and I think he rather agreed with me, that it wasn't much use talking about our massive weapons if we were going to get anywhere. Why do you think he brought it up? Did he? Do you think he believes that we could not make one? Oh, no, I think he must know that we could make one. I think he brought it up, if, if I recall it correctly, it was in connection with testing, uh, that his scientists were after him, urging him to test, and his military people were urging him to test, just as some over here are. And this might be a development if there were testing. I think that was the connection in which he brought it up. Well, I wondered whether it might have something to do with a more general attitude, which perhaps is brought on by the... Russian lead over us in space. Does that affect their attitude toward disarmament? I don't know. I would only be conjecturing about that. They're very proud of their space uh, uh, achievements and have a right to be. But whether this really affects their attitude on disarmament, uh, I don't know. I w uh, I'm rather inclined to doubt it. Mr. McCloy, um, you had a number of discussions with them, as I understand it, on Berlin, and I know that you've been reluctant to talk about it. But can you tell us this one thing? Is it your impression that Mr. Khrushchev knows the West is prepared to fight to keep Berlin free? Well, it's hard for me to say what is in Mr. Khrushchev's mind. Or I to want your impression. It. I wanted your impression. My impression is that he knows that this situation is very serious. And I tried to uh, convey to him the thought that it was very serious, but I don't believe I was uh, telling him anything. He was aware of it. I believe it is serious. And I think that... Uh, he must realize that on a matter which so deeply uh, affects us and affects our position, our integrity, that uh, it's bound to be serious and the possibilities of a, of a disaster are present. There, there were, as you know, reports in the paper that he told you he was convinced that the United States allies, at least, would not fight to hold West Berlin. No, he didn't. Were those reports accurate? Th those reports were not accurate. No. Mr. Finney. Mr. McCoy, uh, tomorrow the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will start hearing on your and the administration's proposal to pre create a semi-autonomous uh, disarmament agency. I wonder what's the point of uh, hiring hundreds of people and spending millions of dollars to do research and thinking about disarmament when we can't even reach agreement in such a simple, straightforward step as a test ban? Well, in the first place, we've had this disarmament question with us now for the last 15 or 16 years. We're going to continue to have it with us. As long as we have these uh, terrible weapons, you can be quite sure that public opinion around the world, in the United States, amongst our allies, everywhere, is going to, are going to press for disarmament. And if we're going to deal with this very complicated, important question uh, constructively, we ought to have the means and the facilities to deal with it. And that means that you have to have the proper number of scientists, the proper number of uh, military strategists, proper number of economists that affects so wide uh, an aspect of our national life. It affects our defense, it affects our foreign relations, it affects our economy. The great uh, proportion of our economy that is now, a very substantial proportion of our economy that's wrapped up in armament. These things alone require serious, experienced uh, men and facilities to deal with it. And the millions of dollars that are involved in it, uh, I don't know how much it will be, 
the millions of dollars that are involved are, are really infinitesimal compared to the to the billions that we're spending on the uh, arms race. And this simply gives us the type of organization that I believe the country deserves to have to deal with this important question. Well, of course, one thing all the study cannot break down is the mutual distrust which right. has stood in the way of disarmament. I wonder, sir, would it be possible for us to take certain unilateral steps of disarmament to indicate our good faith in this issue and to try to build up some mutual trust? There are perhaps some unilateral steps that could be taken, but I don't believe they could be very drastic or should be very drastic or very far-reaching. There might be some things that would not affect the security of the country to the point that it would be too hazardous to take them. I am them. thinking perhaps of overseas bases, which have always been such a thorn in the side of the Soviet Union. As we get intercontinental missiles and intercontinental bombers, perhaps we can give up some of these bases. Might very well be. Might very well be. Mr. McCoy, another one of your jobs when you came down here was to draft some disarmament plan for the new administration. I wonder, is the administration prepared, either on the disarmament conference or in the forthcoming United Nations General Assembly, to offer a U.S. plan for universal and complete disarmament? We, first thing I did was to draft the plan or help draft the plan, and uh, the major portion of which uh, was the problem for Mr. Dean and the nuclear test ban. The next thing was to deal with the comprehensive disarmament. We have a plan that is now in preparation, being discussed with our allies as well as with the various agencies of the government, and I think we will have a plan that will uh, be a very uh, significant one in, the, in, in this fall. Could you spell out the nature of this plan? I think it's a little start? premature for us to do it, for me to do it now. Mr. Fry. I've just come back from Europe, uh, Mr. McCoy, where much of the talk is about the possibility of a Hungary-type explosion in East Germany. From your background of experience with the Germans, what would you say was, was the likelihood of such a thing? Well, I haven't been in Germany for some time, at least so in Germany to, to such a degree that I could really sense a thing like that. I can realize the, the possibility of a thing of this character developing. I was distressed to see the news this morning about the cutting off of the refugees. This is a, a, uh, a difficult situation and one which might uh, produce uh, developments that might complicate our problem. Do you think that it might serve our bargaining purpose or uh, any other purpose of national interest to threaten to encourage uh, a revolt in Eastern Europe. No, I wouldn't think that, that would tend to improve matters. Uh, Why? Because it's too dangerous? Yes, and I, I don't believe in this threatening uh, business. I think the situation is too serious. I think statesmen have to approach this in a statesmanlike uh, manner, and it's important uh, that we remove the air from uh, threats. I deplore every uh, well, threat, whether it's in connection with a hundred million TNT bomb or whether it would be something in the nature that you suggest. Perhaps I shouldn't have used the word threats or perhaps I should have said uh, should we in our, uh, our propaganda uh, dwell upon the theme of self-determination which might have the effect of encouraging such a revolt. Well I suppose we have to, uh, I believe it's self-determination and uh, free elections are, are part of our, uh, our policy. Uh, they seem to be part of the policy of the Soviet Union uh, and many other places in the world. I believe this we should cling to this as a solid and reasonable policy for us to adopt. But I don't think we ought to do it in such a way that it would stir up uh, revolts and uh, perhaps disappointments and uh, disasters in areas that, uh, unless we're very sure of uh, what we're doing, I should think we should think about the consequences of anything in the nature of a threat, but I wouldn't uh, surrender a principle uh, merely because some possibility may exist that, uh, that, that uh, peoples would uh, be stirred by reason of a uh, self-determination issue. If the East Germans did uh, uh, break out, do you, do you think that the West should do anything to help them? This is a question that I think would require the most careful consideration, and I don't believe I could possibly give an answer to that until I saw the circumstances and knew the circumstances. I wouldn't venture an opinion 
uh, on that. I would. Uh, we're on dan dangerous ground, uh, you, as you recognize when you, on this in this area. Gentlemen, we have two more minutes, Mr. Lerner. Mr. McCoy, I'd like to go back for a moment to the question of the general proposal that you're working on. You said you couldn't spell it out, and I understand that. But I wonder, uh, isn't it possible for the United States to uh, make clear to the world that it is just as intent as the Russians are for really general disarmament? We now have sort of short of nuclear weapons program, which improves our position. Why can't we make a proposal as dramatic in its impact as Khrushchev's ever was? I think we can, and I think we can make one which is just as sincere, if not more so. Uh, I have a feeling that we have been uh, overreached a little bit in this business about uh, the sincerity of our position. I think the fact that we have emphasized controls as much as we have is an indication of the fact that we are earnest about it. We want to know how it works. I think that uh, we will be able to produce a sincere and far-reaching and significant uh, plan. And I think that uh, one of the most important things will be the passage of this bill. Uh, if Congress does pass this bill, this will be an earnest to the world that we are, are sincere about this. And I uh, don't want to put in too big a plug for the bill, but I do feel that if we had that bill so that Congress was supporting it at the coming UN, this would be an indication of our sincerity. Short one, Mr. Newman. Mr. McCloy, what's the position now? Are you going to get a conference with the Russians, and when are you going to see them again? I'm going to see Mr. Zorin again just after Labor Day, which will be a, a, a continuation of the conversations we've already had in Washington and Mo in Moscow. And will a conference with the Russians, a full-scale conference, result? This is not a full-scale conference. This is winding up the, uh, the matters of the matter of the statement of principles, the framework in which a conference should take place, and the composition. Will there be one? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but our time is up. Thank you, Lawrence Vivac. We will tell you about next week's guest on Meet the Press in just a moment. This is Merrill Muller with a forecast for the future. Watch for these dangerous females. Some are sure to create headlines. Betsy, Carla, Debbie, Esther, Francis. All will be names of storms in the upcoming hurricane season. Now, we don't want to count hurricanes before they're hatched. We only want to point out that whether it's weather or whether it's stormy international relations... You'll get fast, meaningful coverage from the award-winning worldwide staff of NBC News. A visit to one of our national parks is an exciting adventure all the family will enjoy. The snow-clad majesty of Mount Rainier, the fabulous fog of Yosemite, the rock-bound coast of Maine. Wherever you go, the scenery's grand. But there is one aspect of our national parks that comes close to being a national disgrace. And that is the careless littering of these beauty spots. The thoughtless tossing of trash just anywhere on roads and trails and campsites. Last summer, every visitor to our national park left an average of two pounds of litter behind. Every tissue, every can or cart, and every paper cup, every litter bit hurts. So wherever you go this summer, to a national park or your hometown park, think before you throw Think how you'd like the park to look and stash your trash in the car litter bag, the nearest litter barrel, or take it out with you. That's how you can help keep America clean and beautiful. Today's Meet the Press panel consisted of Ed Newman, NBC News, John W. Finney, New York Times, Max Lerner, New York Post Syndicate, and William Fry, Christian Science Monitor. For a printed copy of today's Meet the Press discussion, send 10 cents in coin and a stamped self-addressed envelope to Merkel Press. That's M-E-R-K-L-E. -E, Merkel Press, 809 Channing Street, Northeast, Washington, D.C. Next week, Meet the Press will have as its guest Dean Rusk, Secretary of State. Vacationing America stays better informed, tuned to NBC.